Okay, I, I can definitely hear something there, Jonathan. Do you hear me? Hey, oh, I hear you. Oh, perfect. I hear you. <laughs> okay. Excellent. <laughs> Hi there, uh, Jonathan. Uh, welcome uh, to the Bishop Arts Theater Center Clubhouse uh, channel, where we're here to discuss uh, just playwriting in general and how awesome. you've, you've maneuvered everything. I really do appreciate you. Before uh, we do get started, uh, I do want to... Uh, uh, acknowledge the Humanities Texas for uh, sponsoring this really, really wonderful uh, speaker series, and uh, also to acknowledge that the Bishop Arts Theater Center uh, sits uh, along the lands of many, many different tribes uh, that uh, we wish to acknowledge and make sure that we uh, honor uh, as we as we go forward with any conversations and um, just. <laughs> like really, uh, I, I am just so excited to be here with you, Jonathan, today. Uh, thank you so, so much for agreeing to this. Uh, before we do get started, I would love for you to just uh, introduce yourself to everyone uh, and let them know who you are because you are just like this uber inspirational, uber amazing, amazing playwright. And I'd just love to uh, have everyone get introduced to you. Awesome. Sure. Uh, and before I get started, I yeah. just want to check. This is my first time on Clubhouse, so am I doing something wrong? Is it okay if it's audio? Did you see me? I don't yeah. know what I'm doing. Yeah, Clubhouse is all audio, so you don't oh. have to worry about anything oh at all. Oh my god. Okay, yes. thank you. <laughs> because right before, I was like freaking out, like, uh, oh my god, how do I get into this? Okay, perfect. <laughs> so, hi everybody, my name is Jonathan Norton. Uh, my pronouns are he, him, his. Uh, I am the playwright in resident at the Dallas Theater Center, um, and also I, I serve in the capacity uh, as, as the liter literary manager. And also, I'm so glad that this is audio, because it's 10 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> and you probably don't want to see it. You and me both, you and me both, I am a mess sitting at a cafe just trying to get my life together right now. So <laughs> the benefits of audio. I love the radio is making a comeback like this because gosh, do I, do I got the face for radio? I got the face for radio right here. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so uh, tell us, uh, Jonathan, if, if, if you don't mind, what got you into... Um, this wonderfully, wonderfully interesting relationship called the theater. What what brought you into the theater? Uh, it started um, when I was in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Kentucky uh, Washington High School for performing and visual arts. Um, and at that time, uh, my freshman year, I was uh, in a production of Joe Turner's Come and Gone at Theater 3 uh, and by August Wilson. And that wow. just had a huge impact on me. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, being 15 years old and and having the opportunity to see, I had like two scenes, two really cool scenes. Uh, having the opportunity uh, to speak that beautiful language like eight mm -hmm. shows a week and to sit backstage in the green room and just listen and hear this poetry like every day. Mm -hmm. um, just had a huge uh, impact. And so I started um, uh, writing scenes and short monologues backstage. Mm -hmm. uh, and I would recruit actors to the show uh, to perform <laughs> them for me backstage. And I later learned from my dear friend and mentor, uh, Vicky Washington, collaborator, uh, Vicky Washington, who was also in the show, that eventually they just would hide. They'd be like, oh my God, here he comes. He has paper in his hand. Hide. Not the floor. Oh, man. That was kind of my entry point. And then at Pucker T, uh, you know, we had like a, um, within the theater division, we had um, uh, also a playwriting track, I suppose, that you could take, mm -hmm. which was taught by Ellie Lindsay. And so I started started there really with Ellie and and playwriting. Wonderful, wonderful. Yeah. Well, yeah. So to have your first introduction into theater being August Wilson, uh, what a wonderful, <laughs> <I> know, <right? laughs> wonderful blessing right there. I mean, usually it's something like, I don't know, 
Narnia or some some film that got adapted to stage or something like that. Um, but August like Wilson. Junior version of Layman. Exactly, exactly. Something, yeah. <laughs> uh, oh my gosh. So, in terms of of your playwriting journey, um, right. because. That, that's actually one of the biggest, most interesting things of all is the, the journey of a playwright in theater, to me at least, being a playwright myself. Right. Um, how have you maneuvered it? How have you um, survived it? Because I don't know uh, if it's me projecting a little bit, but it is one of those things where you go to school, whether it's college, high school, and you have a lot of people that want to be playwrights, actors, all of these different things. Right. And as the years pass, more and more of them end up leaving the business altogether or um, they, they walk away from it or, or they pivot in some way. What has kept you uh, inspired and engaged in playwriting as a form um, through, through your time as a playwright? What, well, you know, honestly, um, I, I too was one of those people uh, who after college uh, began to kind of drift away from it. Well, I drifted away from playwriting because I think that at the moment where I thought I wanted to be a director, I emphasis where I thought I wanted to be a director. <laughs> and so I like stage man I stage managed and I did um, and uh, and then with, with Teresa at Bishop Arts Theater Center, Teresa was like the only artistic director in town brave enough to let me direct something on her stage. <laughs> and actually, it, it always, always went really well. But um, I, I also felt like there was a, a period in there after college where I definitely drifted away uh, from the theater for about a period of maybe about eight years, mm -hmm. um, almost mm -hmm. entirely. Um, and uh, it was actually, um, it was actually Teresa. Mm -hmm. And also Vicky Meek at the South Dallas Cultural Center, who mm -hmm. kind of uh, who pulled me back in. Uh, Teresa with the uh, the play competition, mm -hmm. which have a very funny story about the play competition. Mm -hmm. uh, and then of course Vicky Meek, uh, who was formerly the manager of the South Dallas Cultural Center, but now she's retired and like living her best life. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Vicky Meek with commissioning me uh, to write my first play and giving me like a $2,500 commission, mm -hmm. like which I had never, like it was so unheard of for me and like the most money I'd ever made in theater at, uh, at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it was, it was honestly uh, Teresa and, and Vicky uh, mm -hmm. who kind of pulled me back in. Mm -hmm. uh, and and with the, with the play competition because uh, Bishop Arts doesn't really I don't think we did the, the Bishop Arts does it anymore but uh, there's still like a one act play festival of various uh, themes that, mm -hmm. that that the company does each year but yes. kind of back in the day there was like a competition where there were like six playwrights six, six one act plays and audiences would come to watch them and, and vote on their favorites and of course, being the nervous, insecure kind of like, I don't know if I want to do that playwright. I just, I just never applied to it for like maybe a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And she would always ask me like, "Hey, you're gonna apply to um, uh, to the festival?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'll see." And then I would just conveniently forget about it. <laughs> um, but then, uh, like, look at God. Like, what happened was that. Um, I wanted to, when I decided that I really wanted to try and get back into writing, mm -hmm. um, I reached out to Teresa. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was like, hey, you know, I was thinking about starting a writer's group. And I was wondering if I could do it at Bishop Arts. And she was like, of course you can. And so I would go in like once, uh, like we were going like once a month and with the group of playwrights. I think it was once a month or once every two weeks. To, Group of playwrights. Uh, Jason Hensel was one of them, uh, mm -hmm. and um, we would just meet at Bishop Arts and read our pages and talk about work and what have you and writing. And in the course of that, she the announcement came out about the One Act Play Festival, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, submit your plays, submit your plays. Well, now since I was basically, you know, at Bishop Arts like at least once a month and chatting 
with Teresa Austin, it was I had no excuse. I had no way of pretending that I didn't know uh-huh. or that I forgot about the deadline. So right. I applied. It was scary, as scary as I thought it would be. Uh, but I, lo- I won the literary prize. Uh, mm-hmm. But not the, the main prize for the votes. Um, and then I, and then I, um, but then once I did that, like kind of like that fire under you, like you wanted to go for the gold. Uh-huh. So, and so, or at least she's like, you got to reapply so you can try to get next year for the grand prize. And so I was like, okay, I guess I'll do it. Okay. <laughs> and so I reapplied and that play went really, really, really well, really well. And it won the grand prize. And I remember thinking to myself, great, if I could just win, that was part of my, um, Part of the thing I want to do, I was like, if I could just win the grand prize, then I would never have to do this ever, ever, ever again. You can never ask me to compete, or to enter this contest, because once you win the grand prize, you're no longer eligible for competing again. Uh-huh. And then, of course, the next year, she started the Best of the Best Festival, and I told her, oh, crap, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, but it was honestly a pretty sad to think of, so. It's wonderful. So that's a long, long story, but... Oh. No, absolutely yeah. not. No, no. It, it, it is really one of the, one of those wonderful things how our journeys in the arts are such winding roads that eventually right. lead us back to to our roots in, 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 in so many respects. And uh, one of the things that I've always admired uh, about you in, in, in having in having you be my mentor uh, when I was really first getting started on my journey in playwriting and navigating everything was the kind of fearlessness by which you approached the submissions, uh, just <laughs> sending them out. And so I know there are a lot of other playwrights who might be listening to this live or, or will be listening to the re-record later, but I just wanted your insight and your take on what it takes to actually go and do the darn thing and hit that submit button. What, <laughs> uh, what, what, what inspired you to get that courage? Because there's so many people who don't even take that first step at right. all. And I, I would just love to know what got you um, the, the bravery to, to go there. Um, I think part of it was, um, well, okay, first I'll explain it like this. My experience with uh, development programs, mm-hmm. which are, you know, largely, you know, for playwrights when we're starting out, what we're, what we're submitting to, right? Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I kind of had a very weird uh, introduction to development. Mm-hmm. Um, and so if I can tell that story, it's kind of a Please. interesting um, uh, actually, it's one of those. Um, it, it's I'm visiting with. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I am. Um, <laughs> I am fidgeting with. Good lord! I'm fidgeting with my phone charger. Anyway, so um, okay, no, but it's one of those. It's a really interesting story. It's kind of a, a really pivotal story uh-huh. in my journey. So uh, that commission that Mickey Meek gave me for twenty five hundred dollars, um, I wrote a play um, called "My Tidy List of Terrors" mm-hmm. about the Atlanta child murders. Mm-hmm. And uh, as part of the commission, she uh, we did like a reading or a workshop of it, right? That and she eventually produced it. But first, we did a reading, and then after the reading, we we both knew that there was like more that I wanted to work on with the play, but we weren't quite too sure how I could go about doing that and so I just went online one day a lot but it's just uh, being a nerd and and getting out there and like doing the legwork and the research Mm -hmm. and and trying your best to 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 suss out what type of opportunities are out there Mm -hmm. so anyway um, I went online I just started I just went to Google and just started typing in like playwriting residency playwriting conferences like whatever see what could pull up and obviously mm-hmm. everything I pulled up uh, deadlines had already passed because by this point it was like sometime in May I think May uh-huh. of 2011 um, and and then I remember there was this program called the Theodore Ward Prize which mm-hmm. was like out of Chicago and it's for African American um, uh, playwrights and so I tried to look that program up but it had um, uh, uh, they had gone on hiatus or whatever, or sunset. Um, and but through that program, I had learned about this uh, organization. Uh, it's a really great conference, the Black and Latino Playwrights Conference, mm-hmm. which is run by um, uh, Eugene Lee out mm-hmm. of uh, Texas State University in San Marcos. 
it's a really amazing program. And and uh, I went on, on onto their website to try and learn more about the program. But I couldn't determine based on the website if the program was still in existence. Mm -hmm. So uh, there was an email link to Eugene Lee. So I, I tried to send an email, but um, the link kept it, it wouldn't go through. So mm -hmm. here's where the nerdy thing kicked in. So because I'm a nerd, and because like every, you know, March and April, I, I'm always like, you know, on American Theater Magazine and Playbill, wherever I can be to find out like what the new seasons are, right? And mm -hmm. just visiting different theater websites and figuring out what their new seasons might be. So because of that, I knew that Eugene, Lee, Eugene uh, Lee was in a production of The Book of Grace by Susan Ory Park at the mm -hmm. Zachary Scott Theater in Austin. Mm. And so I said, okay, so I can't, the email's not going through. What if I write a letter to Eugene Lee, <laughs> but send it to the theater, because based on the, the date, it's like, well, he's in for performance now. So, you know, I mean, it, maybe they'll put it on the call board. So I wrote a letter to Eugene Lee. Um, it, it got to him. And he gave me a phone call, uh, and he was like, hey, you know, the deadline's passed, but, but I love to read new work and learn about new playwrights, so please send me your play. So I sent him the play. Mm -hmm. And then about a week later, he called back, and he was like, hey, I read your play. I, you know, I really enjoyed it, and I really, I, I really love it. But, you know, the deadline's passed, like I said. And plus, you have two young kids in the play, and... And we can't really cast the young kids, but you know, be sure to just you know keep keep me up to date on what you're doing, what have mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. And when he hung up, there's the weirdest thing. Like, do you know how you have this? Every now and then, you have that moment where there's like a voice, and uh -huh. it just tells you something. And like the voice is like, you're going to hear from him again next week, and it's going to be good news. Like, legitimately, I heard that, right? Uh -huh. And and the next week, uh, next week comes. My, uh, the phone rang, I look, it's Eugene. I'm like, oh shit. And he was like, you know, you know we got some extra money from, I think it's the NEA. We got some extra money from the NEA so we can bring in an extra playwright. So I was wondering. <laughs> and I talked to the chair of the department and he said, you know, it's a reading. It doesn't really matter about the age of the kids. We'll just put our students and have our students do it. So are you interested in coming down for the conference? So I was like, of course. Um, and so from a professional standpoint, in terms of development and submitting, that's kind of, and although I didn't officially submit to that, what ultimately happened was that when I got to the Black and Latino Press Conference and I was working there, my director, this wonderful woman um, named Michelle, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Melissa Maxwell, well, there's so much fun. Um, Melissa, one day at breakfast, she handed me a list and she was like, okay, now here's a list of places you better apply to. Apply, uh, please apply to these places. And because Melissa told me to apply, I was like, okay, I got to apply. But I ended up procrastinating, and I only ended up applying to one place. And the one place that I applied to was Playpen. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. <laughs> you got it. <laughs> I have got, got it. And then after that, though, I think in terms of continuing to submit to development opportunities uh, and also really uh, whenever I talk to playwrights uh, emerging playwrights I always try to encourage them um, and steer them you know toward development programs and development opportunities I think that you know when you're starting out um, I feel like aside from the fact that there's just great opportunities uh, to grow and learn as a playwright I think they're just also your, your best bet in terms of, of getting um, professional opportunities, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and also, the fact of the matter is that, you know, unlike theaters, you know, if you, A, most development opportunities, um, anyone can apply to, you mm -hmm. know? So it doesn't matter if you have an agent or who you know, you can apply right. to the program. And, you know, a lot of theaters, there are um, uh, limits to who can apply. Mm -hmm. And the other great thing about about development programs is that you will get notified. <laughs> you yes. know? That's not always true with theaters. You don't always know. Like, 
and it may be a while, and, and typically the great thing about these development programs is they'll usually be notified in a very specific point of time. They'll, they'll let you know. It'll be yeah. like, okay, you'll know something by April or whatever, mm -hmm. you know. So you're not just kind of on the hook always wondering uh, what's going on with them. And then if you if you don't make it, but say that you're a finalist, that's really awesome too. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was actually able to use finalist status at a few places to get theaters who would not read my play because I didn't have agents to actually read the play. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, it was yes. a finalist for the O'Neill. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, okay, sure, we'll read it. You know? And then mm -hmm. also the O'Neill sends out their own list as well. And right. everyone takes a look at that, you know. So from that standpoint, it's it's great. It's just, it's I feel like in terms of if you want to say all capital letters professional, if you want to think of it that way, mm -hmm. you know, those are typically like the the biggest professional opportunities that you can get early in your early in your career. Mm -hmm. um, and then also uh, the other reason why I think that they're uh, wonderful programs is simply because you get to you know if you get in you get to meet and work with and collaborate and form relationships with you know maybe six or seven other playwrights and and right. six directors and six dramaturgs and and all the other people who are working on the conference you know that or festival that particular summer you know so you really get to kind of extend extend um your community of, of friends and supporters and collaborators. Uh, mm -hmm. You get to meet so many wonderful people that if it, if it were just a single solitary production that you got, you would never meet all those people. I mean, I think of in, in your own career, like think of all the wonderful people you've had a chance to meet right. because of the different programs who you never would have met had it if it just been one production of your play at a theater somewhere. Absolutely. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that that segues perfectly into one of the biggest questions. You know, a lot of people like to portray playwrights as, you know, these solitary figures who just come out every so often from their cave with a new play and, and that's about it. But right. I've noticed in, in my own journey, at least, that community has been the thing that has been the facilitator of most of my personal um, achievements and milestones as a playwright. Could you uh -huh. talk a little bit about the importance of building community as uh, an emerging playwright, as a playwright that's uh, trying to go towards that, you know, capital professional, uh, as, as you called it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I want to also say that in terms of all capital budgets professional, yeah. uh, I, you know, what I, what, I, uh, what I meant by that was just like, you know, I mean, if you want to put yeah, something no. on your resume that of you course. Think might pay attention to, right, right, one of absolutely. those programs might do, you, might do that for you. Exactly. But, exactly. Yeah. You yeah. Know. But in a largely the in terms of community, um, I I have a, a commission. I just got a really cool commission. I can't yet talk about. Uh -huh. but I, I think I told you about it, but I can't talk about it publicly. Right. 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 Um, right. <laughs> uh, and I'm so excited about it, and that really took me through um, uh, an, a a theater artist at that particular theater who just sent me um, a Facebook message one day and was like, hey, you know, we have this program. Would you be interested in this? You know, and that was someone who I just knew through attending convenings yes. and conferences and things and, and stuff like that. Uh, and her getting to know me and kind of know my work uh, in that way, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and just other um, people just being able, people being able to point you uh, mm -hmm. oftentimes like in a better direction or you know a different direction than, than maybe you were you were thinking of right. um, and then also I think that playwrights are always other playwrights best advocates which also goes back to the reason why those development opportunities uh, are so wonderful simply because the fact that that you get to, to uh, meet these people who will be the people that you kind of come up with, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then also there's uh, beyond um, beyond other playwrights, it's just the opportunity to meet other theater makers, right. uh, other people, maybe dramaturgs or directors in new play development, literary right. managers, getting to meet folks like that. And what I've learned 
I remember I had this kind of epiphany moment. Um, it's kind of a heartbreak story because it's it's tied to something really kind of bittersweet. It's tied mm-hmm. to Humana, which for me is uh-huh. like, uh, uh, oh, I know it's tied oh. to Humana. For those who don't know, I've been to Humana twenty twenty, and of course it got shut down because of the pandemic. But it was just one whole epiphany moment for me. Um, damn phone. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I thought it was on the computer, so I didn't charge. God, wait a minute. Okay. There we go. So, um, I remember when I was on the, when, when I remember it vividly, I was at the airport. I was walking to my gate on my way to a rehearsal for uh, my play at the Humana Festival. Mm-hmm. And in that moment, this I just thought about the fact that um, that I knew, I felt like I knew the people. I, I, I mean, I just kind of just met uh, Robert Barry Fleming through that particular project. Mm-hmm. But what was cool was that um, Jenny Page White, the literary manager, um, and also um, Amy Wagner, um, Wagner mm-hmm. uh, the uh, director of new play development there, I realized yeah. that these were two people who had come to know my work over the years because I had submitted so much stuff to them. <laughs> I mean, and, I, and, and understand, I didn't have an agent at the time, right? Right. So I was just submitting to Actors Theater um, with, oh, there's a story behind that too. But I was just submitting to Actors Theater Louisville without an agent, and every year I would just submit, I would submit, I would submit, because I got an invitation to do it. And because of that, they got to read my work, get to know my work. And I just had this epiphany moment with, you know, on, the, and on my way to my gate to go back to Louisville for a rehearsal, when I realized, oh, wait a minute, you know what? I don't know, and I don't know how this idea or this thought, I don't know how it popped into my head, but um, I, I thought to myself, oh, wow, they know your work. Like, they really know your work because they've been following you for, like, the last five years. Like, right. they legitimately know everything you've written in the last five years. And so mm-hmm. you didn't get her by fluke. Like, they legitimately know and love and appreciate your work. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and for me, what was important about that was that it just reminded me of how often in this business we um, we don't care what door we knock on, right? We yeah. just knock on any and every door. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Right. And and you don't even know if the people who, whose door you're knocking on are even people that you want to like, that you would like or be friends with or want to be around or, mm-hmm. or trust with your children if you had children. You know what I mean? Right. You don't know anything about these, these people or these organizations. But you're just knocking on doors, knocking on doors, knocking on doors. And what if in that scenario, as as you're just knocking on any door, any and every door that you can, um, you do happen to encounter, you know, people that you don't, and people in situations that you would not want to be a part of, right? right. Um, so this idea of, of letting a relationship, you know, develop over time and having the opportunity for people to kind of get to know you, even if it's they're getting to know you through your work. Um, but there's great value in that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's just like there's value in 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 folks getting to in getting to know people a little bit over time, even if even if it may not be a personal one on one experience. It's something about right. the fact that if they feel like they've been following your work um, I think there's a sense of understanding and respect of your voice there. Right. Um, that's that's really meaningful, um, and just something I kind of simpatico that ultimately when when you start working and collaborating with them, it can be a really fruitful and uh, and healthy healthy experience. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it was just like the weirdest thing. I was like, oh yeah, this is a relationship that I've been developing for a while even though I didn't know it and right. these are not necessarily strangers to me. Yeah. and that felt really good absolutely absolutely and now I heard you mention the the, the the big word that a lot of playwrights 
they it's almost like a a, a Don Quixote kind of journey uh, uh-huh. for them. Agents, <laughs> uh, <laughs> agents, agents. I would love, just absolutely love, and appreciate your insight into what is the as as both a playwright and as a literary manager as well with the Dallas Theater Center. Um, what what does that mean? What does an agent mean for a playwright? Does a playwright need one right at, right off the bat? Because I know you mentioned that you were submitting by yourself uh, for a while before any agents came into into your orbit. What what did it mean to what, what what does an agent mean for a playwright in their career? And when is the right time to get one? Is is really my question there? Oh gosh, you know I, I know uh, <laughs> I know. <laughs> okay, hold one sec. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm staring at my phone right now. I'm trying to. I let me tell you real quick. So I got like the worst phone charger in the whole wide world, which I happened to purchase in an airport because I was really in a bad situation and I needed a charger. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, so I just got a really horrible charger and I'm sitting here fighting with the phone and the charger in this moment. So (laughs) anyway, about age. (laughs) Um, Oh God, I had so many thoughts about agents, especially now that I'm at DTC. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, at DTC, you know, we get plays sent to us by agents. So it's really, it's interesting being a playwright on the other side of that and seeing what that is actually like, you know? Right. And right. I don't mean in any way to slight agents and be like, oh, they're not important. But it's weird, like, when you get those emails, they are very important. But when you get those emails, you're like, oh, they sent an email. And I'm like, huh, I can send an email. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right, no. Kind of knowing how to send the email, you know, or, or yeah. having something that you can send the email um, that that allows, that gives you a certain uh, credibility, right. or maybe having to connect people at a physical function. So anyway, I was like, I can send an email, but anyway, that's a side <laughs> thought. Um, I will say this about agents. What, what people say when they say the agents can't get you work, I think that's very, very true. I think it's, it's um, they can get you work if you have already established yourself and gotten yourself to a point um, where um, folks are really excited and knocking on your door, mm-hmm. then I think they can keep like pouring gasoline on that and just make it, you know, that, and that they can blow that up to help get you more work. I think they can do that. But I think that in the early stages of, of your career and your relationship, you're getting, you're still kind of, you're still getting the work, having to get the work yourself. Yeah. Um, and that's mostly like your own relationships uh, and conferences and all this that we spoke of earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think that what, what agents are wonderful for and so and and really really, really necessary for uh, and I think they don't get a lot enough praise for is simply um, a uh, being another collaborator a sounding board uh, someone with a certain amount of expertise or experience uh, who can kind of help guide you right. you know um, and they have info about the industry that perhaps you would not have Mm -hmm. um and then also they're really valuable when you do get that work which might in fact be work that you did that you got yourself regardless of that you know you're still going to need them to help you negotiate that contract yeah uh work with that theater make sure that you get the best um the best deal possible, make right. sure that you're looked after and taken care of. Mm-hmm. They, you, you still need, they're, you need them for that. I mean, they have a lot of expertise about um, best practices and what's yeah. fair and what's not fair. Um, and so I think they're really valuable on that, in that regard. Mm-hmm. So again, I think starting out, there may not necessarily be the people who can absolutely start getting you work, like just because of like a you know, a play comes into the office, it doesn't automatically mean we're gonna program every play that comes into an office from an agent. We just we, we can't do that anyway. There's not enough 
slots. You know what right. I mean? Absolutely, so absolutely. Just with an agent jumping in doesn't automatically mean uh, that it, it will get more traction, perhaps, mm-hmm. than something that was sent in um, uh, either through a playwright who we already know or have some sort of relationship with, mm-hmm. or perhaps another theater artist who says, hey, this is really amazing play that I think you should know about. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, those are my thoughts about agents. Right. Uh, great to have from a strategy standpoint. Um, and someone also to keep you accountable so that you are doing the work that you need to be doing to push yeah. yourself along so that we can all kind of grow together. And yeah. definitely really important from the business negotiation yeah. contract side of things. Absolutely, no, absolutely. I I completely agree with you on the uh, on the contract side of things. I have yeah. uh, I have a friend who got a, a similar commission uh, as me, uh, same organization and everything. And no, don't he, tell he, me. I know what you're about to say. Yep. Say he he didn't have an agent. Uh, I had an agent, and the difference in the commission amount was about four thousand dollars. Whoa. And yeah, yeah, because they said we it's either take it or leave it with him, and my agent said no, my previous client got this amount from them so i know you got it <laughs> you know um so it's like it, it does make that difference but i, I do agree with you um in wow that, yeah it was it was substantial enough that i'm like all right you earned your 10 percent. i get it <laughs> exactly you yeah earned 10%. <laughs> you got it you, mean, he, like, you know the other like your friend who you know without the agent you know it, it is that kind of you take this you know you, you you take it or leave it kind of thing yeah. Yep. Yep. And, and and it really can be that way when you when you aren't represented. But at the same time, I, I, I completely agree with you as well that you really have to do the hustle yourself yeah. uh, before an agent will notice you. Because really, I love the metaphor that you use of gasoline on a fire. That's really what an agent's looking for. They're looking that's for a they fire do. that's burning. Oh. Yeah, th- that's all they do is they just put gas on the fire. And I think um, that what I've learned in the last year or so that I've had, uh, that I've been represented, um, is that now, a lot of we often get agents before there's a fire to put a gasoline on. Yes. <laughs> and that's what happens sometimes with people. And then when you get the agent, but there's not the fire yet, you're yeah. like, I don't understand what they do. Yeah. And it's like, well, boo, you need to create the fire first. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it, it's really, it's almost like chess pieces. Um, yeah. you, you can't expect a knight to do the moves of a rook. You, you, right, you just right, can't. Right. They, they, they have a certain skill set, and it's one of those things that you kind of have to make peace with um, and, and know that they're um, necessary, but in a way that you're not expecting. And I, I think that's right. one of those things that especially emerging playwrights don't quite know. I think sometimes they confuse an agent with a manager um, is, is what I think their, their biggest thing is. But that's a whole other I've been wondering a lot about managers. I've had really? a lot of questions. Uh-huh. <laughs> You know, um, I think it all depends on where you're going with your career when right. it comes to having a manager uh, versus an agent. I think at the end of the day, both are necessary depending on where you're going. Right. Um, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, such a, it's such a fascinating difference, you know, between uh, having a lawyer, an agent, and a manager um, and how you build that team right. uh, when, you're, when you're building your, your resume. But one of the things that I think a lot of playwrights would be interested that I think you have a particularly unique insight into, and you, you mentioned it earlier, um, is that kind of um, being on the inside, as it were, of a Lort Theater like Dallas Theater Center um, and seeing it from the perspective of both a, a playwright that is, that is, you know, maneuvering through his career as well as being the literary manager and associated with Dallas Theater Center, uh, what kind of insight can you give to playwrights who are really trying to make some kind of an impression with these kinds of regional theaters or, or, or uh, more known theaters that are, you know, in that Lort level or, or, or off Broadway or whatever? You know, there's so many different labels, but I, I would love to know your insight in, in terms of that because there are lots of playwrights that would love to know. Well, how can I message them? They don't. They they, they seem so um, unable to be contacted. <laughs> Right. Well, I will say, first of all, that at DTC, uh, we do have a, uh, a submission on our on our mm-hmm. website. Um, there is a, actually a portal for DFW-based playwrights mm-hmm. where they can submit work to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, so 
So that's actually on the website, um, which I'm, I'm really thankful for. Mm-hmm. Uh, aside from that, though, in general, the what I've learned being on the, uh, the inside, and I don't mean to sound uh, uh, shady or anything, in the, or anything like that in spaces. Right. I, I, I mean it for myself. I don't even mean it for other people. I mean it for myself. Is that you can't take shit personally. You can't take it personally. You mm-hmm. really cannot. Um, there's, there's, there's so many reasons. You begin to see all the different reasons why really amazing plays uh, don't get programmed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you begin to see why uh, uh, some other really amazing plays are not even able to make it to like the uh, uh, what's the word uh, uh, the shortlist of right. consideration because you know every every organization uh, they have different programming needs mm-hmm. uh, perhaps different communities uh, different I guess typically at DTC. Something that I think playwrights should always be thoughtful of, or especially local playwrights should be thoughtful about, is the fact that you know we have an acting company. Right. So the work, really, really great, exciting work that feels like it would uh, fit well on various members of the company. Mm-hmm. Uh, those kind of plays were always excited by, right? Right. So particularly, and I think this is definitely for local writers it's like the more that you uh, um, that you can have a sense of ensemble and then also you know ensemble that the kind of like work too well with the company not all it doesn't have to be every member of the company but maybe right. this grow that like oh my god Sally would be amazing in this you know what I mean right. so right. those are things to consider um, I'm not saying that that would automatically get a play program. Oh my God, I feel like I'm saying something. Right. Like you know what I mean? But right. what, I, what I mean to say though, is just be really, be really smart and thoughtful um, about where your work might, uh, be really smart and thoughtful about the best home for your work. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think a lot of playwrights tend to have a sometimes have a very kind of like machine gun uh, approach to things of just mm-hmm. submitting everywhere you know and mm-hmm. I don't think that that's useful mm-hmm. um, and now I feel like I'm rambling what I have meant to say and what I've been thinking about the whole last the last week is this mm-hmm. um, um, you really have to be thoughtful uh, about identifying those theaters that are or that have incredibly robust uh, new play development programs. I think that's always a smart move. Uh, identify those theaters and and those are should like for me now like when I'm when I'm trying to create my own strategy for production opportunities outside of DTC. And when I'm talking to my agent, you know, what we're looking at or trying to, to really uh, um, focus on are those companies that, that seem to have a really robust uh, new play development program, you know? And so by that, it's like, you know, theaters that have like uh, maybe a play festival that they do every year or theaters right. that have like a really significant commissioning program or a really significant workshop type program in addition to you know the plays that they produce right Mm -hmm. because basically Mm -hmm. in american theater you have producing organizations and then you have development organizations and then within producing organizations you have some organizations that are largely really just producing organizations they produce plays, right but then you have other organizations that are like uh they certainly produce but they do a, a ton of new play development uh, throughout the year. And I think the reason why those are good companies to, to focus on uh, is simply because they have more points of access. 
more points of access, you know, uh, a variety of different doors that you can enter um, aside from, from just one door. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so that is, for me has been the biggest takeaway. And, and I think um, it reminds me too of like uh, Accuracy of the Lyrigo and Humana. And, and one of the reasons why I kept submitting, I got an invitation to submit uh, from the, um, the, the, the resident dramaturg who is no longer there. Yeah. Um, but they, uh, it was 2014. And I attended the Humana Festival as, you know, just as a visitor uh, to see the plays because my mentor, Will Power, had a play in the festival. Mm. And I went with Teresa. So me and Teresa took a big road trip uh, <laughs> to Louisville for the Humana Festival. We had a great time. And while I was there, uh, one morning I shadowed uh, uh, Will. was like, hey, you want to come hang out with me? So I went and hung out with Will. And we went into the administrative offices at Accuracy of Louisville. I was all stoked and geeked out. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I got to meet the resident dramaturg. And they, um, uh, they, oh, oh, this is the other important thing I remember. This is important about the story. The resident dramaturg was uh, an alumni of the Yale School of Drama. Uh -huh. And at the time, um, the students, the dramaturgy students at Yale, I think what they still, they serve like a literary management capacity as, as well for the Yale rep. And mm -hmm. at the time, um, a few years prior, I had sent that play, My Tidy of the Two Terrors, like a 10 page sample to Yale rep, and then they asked to read the, the play. And when I got the letter back, the person who had signed the letter was the resident dramaturg at, at Actors Theater. So I kind of mentioned that to her. Uh, and, and in the, you know, and, and she got a kick out of it and I mean, they, they got a kick out of it. And then they, um, they just said, Hey, you know, we have this policy, yada, yada, yada. You have to do this or that, you know, submit, um, a 10 page sample or whatever. But she, they were like, forget that. Uh, and they said, um, just, you know, just send me the play and send it to me, remind me that we met. It's all good. And so I sent, I started sending work to them because of that. And every year I would get like a really, really encouraging rejection letter. And I keep submitting because I was like, it's Actors Theater Louisville and they have the Humana Festival. And that is definitely a door that playwrights should be knocking on. Mm -hmm. um, and I keep submitting and keep submitting and keep submitting. And they started submitting in like 2014. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and then in 2019 was when I got the email. Uh, from uh, Actors Theater inviting me to be part of the festival, which was, you know, after, you know, five years of them getting to know my work mm -hmm. without an agent. Right. Maybe it's been right. quicker if it happened, I had, had an agent. I don't know. Although I will say this, the year that I got into Humana, there, I think, were two other playwrights also in the festival who also did not have agents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's that. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I know when I when I got in the Playwrights Week at the Lark before it mm -hmm. closed, um, I didn't have any agents, and um, many did that that did get the uh, Playwrights Week at the Lark. So, right. yeah, it, it is it is definitely one of those things. I, I completely completely agree with you on that whole. It's 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 about working that that angle and just keeping right. on knocking on that door. Um, I look at it like this. Eventually, somebody's got to answer. I know. <laughs> The light's on. I see it's on in there. Someone's going to answer. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, now, uh, and, and then we're, we're coming close to time there because I know I, I, I only said an hour, so I could talk to you forever, though, because you are, you, you're, just a, 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 you are just a wealth of information and knowledge. Uh, but I would love to have your, your thoughts, because I know we've discussed it often, about how important it is um, to really kind of own your town to, 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 to be part of the local community as a playwright. Um, and even if your national profile increases, the kind of importance to always have an artistic home where, where you began. Um, and I know that you are a mainstay of, of the Dallas theater uh, community and 
you, you, you know, for me personally, you are an inspiration. And I know for others, they feel very, very much the same. But I would love your thoughts on, you know, the kind of primacy of New York and Chicago and those, those bigger theater towns and why it's important for playwrights to really consider local um, rather than just going straight at uh, the, the big towns. Not, not, nothing against them. I'm from New York myself. But, uh, yeah, I would just love your thoughts on, on what it means to be a local playwright. Um, you know, first of all, Dallas is, is my home. I grew up here. It's, uh, I felt like there's something in the water that, uh-huh. uh, that kind of feeds me. Uh-huh. <laughs> you know? mm-hmm. And that I thrive on, and so that's important. And also, you know, something, um, I, I had another epiphany moment um, a few, about a few years ago when I was at, uh, at Access Theater in Louisville. Um, I was, I was, it was at rehearsal break, and I was in the rehearsal hall, and I was having lunch, and uh, Robert Barry Fleming, the artistic director, uh, he came in and sat with me and we started having lunch and we started talking. And I think at the moment I did have this, this thing about being from Dallas. Because, you know, when, you, when you're a playwright, you know, you, in, the, in the theater in general, like you said, there's kind of that privacy thing mm-hmm. of New York City, right? And yeah. so I was kind of like, oh my God, how did I get here? I'm from Dallas. Like, I'm happy to be here. But at the same time, I felt a little bit like, how did I get here, you know? Right. And it was weird. I remember having, sitting there and having lunch with him and, and, and talking and, and somehow another Dallas came up and what I said kind of shocked myself and I wasn't prepared, I wasn't anticipating to say this, but what I said was that, you know, I realized that being in Dallas has actually afforded me the opportunity to, to get production and mm-hmm to actually work in a certain kind of way that if I were in New York City, you know, I mean, for young, you know, emerging playwrights coming up in New York City, largely you're looking at reading after reading after reading after workshop, mm-hmm. after writer's group, and those things, are, those are awesome. Um, but in terms of like what you're learning through production, you're mm-hmm. not necessarily getting those kind of opportunities. Right. And so it's like, oh, wow, I'm getting opportunities here that I would not have had. Um, probably if I were in New York. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was so weird. And, and also I remember thinking that the other two playwrights that were there with me at the time, um, well actually one of them was from San Diego, she was in grad school at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, just remember thinking, oh, I've actually had certain experiences that they haven't had. Even though, you know, as a playwright, you're like, I haven't been to grad school and I don't have an agent and I'm from mm-hmm. Dallas, you know. And it's just one of those moments of realizing, because I just had, um, uh, a love offering happened at Kitchen Dog and Hidden Candy at BTC. And right. so I was like, oh, wait a minute, you know, I mean, there's really, there's opportunity here um, mm-hmm. that might not exist in New York. But the flip side of that is that, you know, you can get something done in a small, uh, you know, roundabout underground in New York City and everybody in the field goes and sees it and that can like blow up in some kind of way if you're lucky. So right. that doesn't necessarily happen. But, but maybe in the future, who knows, you can. Um, mm-hmm. But the other thing is just being able to have a community. I, this is what it is. This is what it is. It's, I sometimes feel like if I were in New York, if you're a playwright in New York, um, the audience who you're writing for tends to be, I, and I could be mad, imagining this wrong, but mm-hmm. tends to just be other theater people and folks who have, you know, who all kind of have a very similar um, uh, experience and understanding and interest in theater and certain right. taste. You know what right. I mean? Especially if right. you're looking at maybe not uptown or Broadway, but probably every, you know, the, the, the off Broadway theaters and yeah. like the, the companies like you know, the public or right. the Paris Rising, you know what I mean? Like, right. you're writing for a very specific kind of audience, right? Right. Uh, and, oh, this is a little bit of something I probably shouldn't say, but I'm going to say it anyway. And, <laughs> and I've realized that some of those places that do really, really well in New York City don't translate well outside of New York City. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. largely because what happens in the regions is that audiences out in the regions tend to be, uh, in a lot of ways, I think, much more diverse mm-hmm. than 
of audiences in New York in that you have a really big mix of people who just maybe want to go out and go out to see a play. They don't really know what they're going to see. They maybe don't see a lot of, a lot of theater often. Right. Um, and so you're writing for uh, a community that I think in a lot of different types of audience, I think in a lot of ways is more kind of like Shakespeare's audience, you right. know, which mm-hmm. is a really broad spectrum of people. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, oh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like I'm rambling, but this just popped no, no. into my head. Uh-huh. You were asking about Dallas Theater Center earlier, and I was kind of talking about DPC, and and I've always felt like kind of um, the 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 thought that I like to use, and I think it's, it's DPC, but I think it's also a lot of of large regional theaters. Is mm-hmm. that it's almost like your when you create work for those large regional theaters, a theater like DPC, I think the work that that the company aspires to do and when we're always at our best is that you're creating work for everyone in the city right mm-hmm. so like from the, the school bus driver to the president of the university you know right. and everybody in between and so again like Shakespeare's audience the work has to be able to resonate with the broadest also broadest possible audience and I feel like being in Dallas uh, or just work being a playwright in the regions in general, I think gives you uh, a big leg up in that regard. Uh, there's actually um, uh, it was a really kind of one-sided, horrible. Uh, what 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 publication was? It? I can't remember. But it was a story about Lauren Anderson, uh, who was legit one of like, the most produced playwrights in America. Yeah. And and she's based out of the Bay Area. And um, the, the the story itself is kind of New York centric. It kind of knocked her a little bit. Kind of had like this New York bias attached to it. Right. But in it they were just trying to explore why she's like the most produced playwright, you know, in America. And and one of the artistic directors who is uh, a great friend and collaborator of hers, who I think, uh, I think it's in, from, the, from the Midwest, I believe, mm-hmm. was just saying how like she understood, she had a great skill at writing, of uh, writing for really broad spectrum of audiences and creators, mm-hmm. you know, um, and understanding what understanding what people who maybe don't go to the theater as often as people in New York City, mm-hmm. understanding <laughs> understanding um, their understanding how they consume theater. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I know that sounds kind of weird, but right, I know, I, you I know, understand. and then she has a real she understands how to do that, you know. Right. Um, and so I, I certainly feel like I've I learned a lot. Like we just did Clue at. Clue just closed to DPC, and it was really one of the things that was really wonderful about it was just seeing so many people um, att- come to the show and just have a lot of fun, and also seeing people like I would kind of, kind of hang out outside the theater and like wait, kind of wait for people who didn't know where they were going, and like, uh-huh. oh no, you want to go that way, like point because they had never been to the theater to DPC before, right? Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. that show like drew them out and drew them to the theater, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's something I'm always trying to figure out and tap into. It's like, what is that thing that that can motivate people, perhaps people who, who've never been to the theater or who rarely go to the theater? Mm-hmm. What is that thing that can motivate them to leave their house and go to the theater or to decide not to go to the basketball tonight? Instead, I'm right. gonna go to the theater or I'm not gonna go to a movie and this so I'm not gonna do whatever. What mm-hmm. is it that 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 motivates them to to do that? Because ultimately, you know, I want theater audiences to you know to look like my family and my my community and the people I grew up with who, who don't go to theater um, right. very often. But I want to find ways to bring them into the theater and create work that 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 they would enjoy, but then also comes a gateway drug so that now that they're here, 
maybe it's like, oh, what else is happening? What else is doing? What else am I missing out on? Mm-hmm. You know? So anyway, that was a long yeah. way of saying. No, I not think. at all. <laughs> The great thing about being in Dallas, one of the great things, is that it's just given me a perspective on audiences and respecting audiences, really respecting audiences, and having the opportunity to develop relationships with audience members. I think that if I were in New York, you know, the relationships that you would develop would just be with largely other people in the field and your colleagues and the people who you're trying to develop professional relationships with. But here, it could be like, you know, fans mm-hmm. You're breaking up a little, Jonathan? Hello? Hi. Yep. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, now I can hear you. Okay. They're not, you know, actors, the directors, the literary managers, producers. They're just people who love theater and love to support theater. Right. And I've had an opportunity to develop relationships with them. And I am not, and I could be speaking out of turn, but I don't necessarily know if like New York playwrights have the opportunity to develop those kinds of relationships just right. with audiences in that. Right. You know? right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's yeah. the same in, in like uh, Los Angeles when you're talking with industry people. Are you right. talking with anyone? Are you forming a friendship or are you building a business relationship? Oh, and my God. Yeah. That's yeah, it, hard. That's yeah. hard. And that was the thing. That was the, when I was telling that's that's one of the things I meant to convey. I don't, think I, was, I don't think I fully articulated it. When I was talking about when I was going to Louisville, but yes. flying, I was on my way to the gate. And I was like, oh, my God, these people kind of know me. That was the thing with the sense of of getting to because once we started like the process with the commission it was like face uh we were doing like face uh facetime this is before like um before the shutdown right so it's like, mm-hmm. like facetime and phone and all that and then they right. flew us to louisville but we just having this opportunity to all get to know each other yeah. and i just remember thinking like oh how how much in this industry we um, we we work so hard to develop relationships, really close relationships, to people who we probably would not want to be friends with. Mm. Otherwise, <laughs> you know yes. what I mean? Uh-huh. And it's oh like, my gosh! Yep. Oh my god! This is toxic. This is not healthy. Yes. So yes. Like, I'm trying to make sure that, and so I try to think in my own way. I mean, like when I have something happen or something doesn't happen for me and I'm like, oh, why didn't they do so-and-so? And then they're like, okay, but did you value the friendship? Like, right. there's right. a friendship and then there's a business thing. Right. So if you're only focused on this business thing, then what does that say about the friendship? You know what I mean? Absolutely. So it's Absolutely. just like, yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, final closing thought uh, <laughs> from you <laughs> because I, I know we're, we're right now in a very interesting transitional yeah. period, I think, in the American theater. Um, as, I'm, as I'm sure you know, and as I'm sure many other playwrights know, places are shutting down, or places are pulling back, places are no longer offering the same kinds of commissions, or they're no longer offering the same opportunities, or the seats at the table have shrunk dramatically. Mm-hmm. Um, you have been in the theater uh, for, for a bit, you're, 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 you're a veteran, and you've seen different aspects of it, you've seen the, the ebbs and flows of it. What kind of advice do you have um, for emerging playwrights and playwrights that might be living in a little bit of doubt right now as they're maneuvering through these very, very interesting times in the American theater? Um, I would say, and this is probably not something that people want to hear or would uh-huh. appreciate, but I would just say, um, and I, I'm talking to myself when I say this. Mm-hmm. To in, it may not feel pleasurable. It may not. It, everything may feel very uncertain. And I'm sure there's a lot of times again we have self doubt. Uh, just that like things are going to work out. But if you can really just whatever small victories that you have that you can to, to can get to be really grateful for them, and and just to enjoy the journey of developing something enjoy the journey of building something, enjoy the journey of trying to create an empire for yourself, uh, 
enjoy, try to figure out a way to enjoy and to appreciate that climb up to whatever it is that you're trying to do. Um, because you're, you're going to need to develop that skill for mm -hmm. real. For the simple mm -hmm. fact that, you know, once you get to the top of one mountain, then you realize, oh, wait, there's another mountain. And then there's another mountain after that. And then there's another mountain after that. So you're always going to be in your career. It's never going to be a moment when you're not having to climb the mountain. Right? Right, right. So even though things are really difficult and uncertain right now, just look at that as the opportunity um, to, to develop that muscle and to try to find some way uh, to find joy in it, like the excitement of when you get a commission, or the excitement of, of if you have a reading somewhere, or the excitement of, and it may seem small, but if you can make it be big for you, right. that, that's important. Absolutely. Just Absolutely. develop that muscle. Because it's Absolutely. always, it's always going to be that way. You're always going to be climbing the mountain. You're going to get somewhere like, great, I'm here. And then it's yeah. going to be like, oh crap, now I need to get there. How do I get there? I don't know how Oh crap, now I have to start all over again. It's absolutely. always going to be that. Always. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. If, if you win the Pulitzer, well, but I didn't get on Broadway. You get on exactly. Broadway, but I didn't win the Tony. If you I won really the Tony, well, can I do it again? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Or, or my plays get done in New York, but they only get done in New York, and they never make it out. Yeah, out yeah. I never get any money back. I never get royalties. I never get money out. Yep, it's not yep. the most produced play in America, so I'm not making any more money off of it. You right. Know I mean? right. No. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, um, final shout outs that you may have. Anything that you want to shout out or or or, or make sure that you amplify, Jonathan. I want to give you the platform to to close out with any kind of amplifications you want to make. Uh, what do I want to amplify? What do I, uh, what do I have coming up right now? Well, I have a show happening, but it won't be until um, the the spring of next year. That's my play. I am delivered. Okay. Uh, at Dallas Theater Center, so I'm really excited about that. But that would be like a whole other season from now. But the one thing I would like to shout out is, because uh, a friend told me that I don't shout this out enough and I need to, uh, that my, I want to plug my book, uh, the, the, the script, uh, Penny Candy. It is mm -hmm. on sale. You can buy it at Deep Vellum Book, <laughs> Deep Vellum Book Store in Deep Vellum, or you can also get it on Amazon. So she's like, you never plug it. There it is. <laughs> Penny Candy. Happy. It's it's really <laughs> wonderful. Penny Candy by Jonathan Norton on Deep Vellum Books or, or Amazon. Go get it. There go get go. it, everyone. Go get it. <laughs> All right. Well. Thank you so, so much once again, Jonathan. <laughs> I really, really appreciate all the insight and the, and the wisdom that you've, that you've shared with us here today at the uh, Speaker Series of Bishop Arts Theater Center. And once again, oh, if, oh yes. Oh, one more thing I wanted to plug. Uh, if you're in Dallas, uh, uh, I just have to plug this. Dallas Theater Center, uh, we're, the next show we're doing is Trouble in Mind by Alex Childress. Mm. It's a play that is so, 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 so dear to my heart. I love this play so much. I'm so happy that we're doing it. So I encourage everyone in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area to get out to see it. And it's directed by Tiana K. Blair, and she is insanely talented. It's going to be amazing. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Make sure to go out and see it, Dallas Fort Worth community. Anyone out there, come on, come on into Dallas. Fly out to see it. It's going to yeah. be an amazing, amazing show. Um, and again, thank you uh, for everything, Jonathan. And huge, huge shout out to Humanity Texas for making this possible. With thank their, you, Humanities uh, with Texas. This, yeah, thank you, Humanities Texas. And uh, of course, to the Bishop Arts Theater Center as well for, for making all of this happen. Um, you have a wonderful, wonderful rest of your you day, too. Jonathan. And uh, thank you again for everyone tuning in. Really appreciate you. Uh, right. Remember, Penny Candy, Deep Vellum Books or Amazon, and make sure to see Trouble in Mind. And make sure also to uh, come see Bishop Arts Theater shows as well. Uh, we're yes, going to be Bishop opening Mike. up a whole bunch uh, more very, very soon here. Fairview is going to be opening up very, very soon. Oh, my God. It, I'm so excited about Fairview. Yes. Uh, I'm it, so it won the Pulitzer. Yeah, I'm it's, it's so gonna, excited. Yeah, it's, 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 it's huge. Uh, so please, make sure to come out, and thank you all once again. Uh, you have a great one, Jonathan. Thank you, Frankie. All right. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.